All right, hello everybody. This is A.W. and uh, here with me is Hyperion and Chaya. And uh, today we're reading uh, one of the big guns from the 1960s. Uh, not so popular nowadays, but uh, he's still a pretty big name if you ever enter a Marxist theory, leftist theory in general nowadays. Uh, Louis Althusser. And uh, we're reading his uh, essay, Lenin Before Hegel. Which should be interesting because, as far as I know, Althusser didn't like Hegel. So let's see what he what he thinks about the, the meaning of the two. All right, beginning. In a lecture now a year old, published in a small volume by Maspero under the title Lenin and Philosophy, I have attempted to prove that Lenin should be regarded as having made a crucial contribution to dialectical materialism, in that he made a real discovery with respect to Marx and Engels, and that this discovery can be summarized as follows. Marx's scientific theory did not lead to a new philosophy called dialectical materialism, but to a new practice of philosophy. To be precise, to the practice of philosophy based on a proletarian class position in philosophy. So, all right, a big bold claim right there. It's interesting. This discovery, which I regard as essential, can be formulated in the following theses. 1. Philosophy is not a science, and it has no object in the sense in which a science has an object. 2. Philosophy is a practice of political intervention carried out in a theoretical form. 3. It intervenes essentially in two privileged domains the political domain of the effects of the class struggle, and the theoretical domain of the effects of scientific practice. 4. In its essence, it is itself produced in the theoretical domain by the conjunction of the effects of the class struggle and the effects of scientific practice. 5. It therefore intervenes politically in a theoretical form in the two domains, that of political practice and that of scientific practice, these two domains of intervention being its being its domains, insofar as it is itself produced by the combination of effects from these two practices. 6. All philosophy expresses a class position, a partisanship, in the great debate which dominates the whole history of philosophy, the debate between idealism and materialism. 7. The Marxist-Leninist revolution in philosophy consists of a rejection of the idealist conception of philosophy, philosophy as an interpretation of the world, which denies that philosophy expresses a class position, although it always does so itself, and the adoption of the proletarian class position in philosophy, which is materialist, that is, the inauguration of a new materialist and revolutionary praxis of philosophy, which induces effects of class division in theory. That was so, quite a lot. Yes, yeah, so that's a big claim, seven big claims, really. Well, Etzusser was very much a hardline Marxist, so many of these, uh, the typical Marxist critiques of a quote-unquote idealism, uh, you yeah. see littered throughout his essays. Yeah, so let's go over these again more slowly. So, I mean, these theses. Thesis 1, philosophy is not a science, and it has no object in the sense in which a science has an object. And uh, in a sense, uh, he's right. I mean, I think this is actually pretty generally recognized by philosophers in which, like, philosophy doesn't have a given object. Uh, when you first engage in philosophy, you say, well, what's philosophy is about? Uh, the answer is, like, well, that's kind of the point of philosophy. You're supposed, to, it's supposed to find out what it itself is about. So, I mean, that's not uh, anything new, really. Yeah, that's not anything objectionable. So it, when he says, in the sense in which a science has an object, uh, that philosophy is, doesn't have an object like that, or is not a science like that, then uh, yeah, you know, that's uh, 
pretty true from like a say from a uh, or at least the, the standpoint of German philosophy at the time uh, you know which was obsessed with science you know Kant science uh, Fichte science Schelling science ever like all of them so we're doing science and it was obviously they meant science and not the the sense in which we meant it by the time you know, also Sarah was working yeah. So I don't think he's working. Yeah. So he's not working yeah. with the conception of Wissenschaft. He's just working with, like, I guess, I think the regular conception of science. Um, so two, philosophy is a practice of political intervention carried out in a theoretical form. And that's a big one, obviously. Uh, this is a common thing that comes. Uh, a lot of people say it, which will say, you know, everything is fundamentally political. Like, there, there is no non-political thing. The philosophy, when it claims to be this disinterested pursuit of the truth, uh, is in fact not ever really disinterested. Uh, it always has presuppositions. And so even if it thinks it's not being political, that it's making no political statements, that it's not telling... Uh, you know, it's not really entering into that uh, muddiness of uh, social life. Uh, it does presuppose it, and you see this uh, in a way. For example, um, Nietzsche does this with Plato. I mean, he jokes a bit. He says it in a joking way, which is funny, but uh, I don't know what the quote is off the top of my head. But he basically says, like, the only way, reason uh, Plato's philosophy could ever have come about is because Plato is basically a rich guy just sitting on his ass all day and had never worked a day <laughs> in his fucking life. You know, that's the only that's the only way you get someone who believes that ideas could be more real than like the material things. And also, obviously, you know, the philosopher king's idea. Well, being a philosopher, who would who does he think you know is best fit to run the world? Well, philosophers, duh. You know, it's like the the typical uh, working person. You know. You know, the, the typical working person would say, it's like, you know, the one who, who's best for the job is the one who gets it done. You know, whether they understand it, whether they know any fancy theory, that's not the problem. You know, it's like, this, the thing's about being practical and getting it done. You know, people don't care so much about that. So, mm -hmm. yeah, you know, in that sense, I can completely uh, understand and agree with that point. That it's, uh, yeah. there are presuppositions in which uh, things have political implications. You can't really separate philosophy from the context in which it was theorized. Yeah, you definitely can't. So, I mean, that definitely puts philosophy in a, a relative stance. However, for me, that standpoint, uh, and uh, this is more of my, where I agree with Hegel and uh, German, the German ideals in general, is that... Uh, you can't really say that when you're talking about, say, something like metaphysics, uh, really. Like, you know, you can't say that uh, Plato's idea of the idea and the forms really had anything at all to do with politics or even material science whatsoever at the time. I mean, it was really just a, a real abstract theoretical thing, which was re in pretty much for itself disinterested. It was interested in knowing, but it was not interested in knowing anything of practical consideration whatsoever yeah. really mm -hmm. so i mean it had implications you know so you know if you find out what the good is obviously then you'll have a theoretical position on you know what politics should be but other than that i mean a lot of this stuff just really has very little to do and uh, it wasn't just a theory either um for example when he says you know uh like the, the famous marxist ma uh, maxim you know um, Marxists claim that, you know, philosophy has only interpreted the world, the point is to change it. Well, obviously, you know, you look at all the history of philosophy back to Plato, that's just not true. Because guess what? A big thing for Plato was ethics. And that wasn't just about interpreting the world. It was saying, like, no, we should be doing these kinds of things. You know, Plato didn't write the Republic because he thought, like, well, you know, it's just for me. Um, he wrote it and he put it out there because he, he thought this was a good idea. This was what people should do. So... So here, um, when he says philosophy is a practice of political intervention carried on theoretical form, um, in that sense, I think he's also right. Mm -hmm. You know, people engage philosophy in, uh, 
if they engage philosophy truthfully, I think, uh, systematically, you never really have to hit on the practical things and you've got to talk about what people ought to be doing. You know, you can't just be saying, oh, well, you know, I care about ep the epistemology of this one thing. And then that's it, you know, in abstract, as if any, as if, you know, you don't really care and as if nobody else should care. You know, if you're studying that kind of thing, you, yeah. there implicitly you must think there must be some importance to this. You know, there mm -hmm. must be some practical implication to it. Because if you have a, a theory or a, even like a skill or something, it's not really useful unless you realize it and act it. Yeah, so in in essence, everything has practical implications. Yeah. If it's taken to its complete logical limit, there's plenty of people who uh, obviously uh, don't really have that kind of interest. Uh, probably the, the, the ones who are most proud of it are pure mathematicians who uh, actually are proud that they have nothing at all <laughs> to do with practical reality. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not talking shit here, by the way. Uh, there are, I forget who it was, but there was a famous mathematician who literally wrote a book just in attacking other people who were daring to say that like mathematics was like a subservient of practice. And he was saying, no, you know, we're just doing our own things. We don't care about like what you end up using it for. We don't care if you think it's useful. We don't care if it's ever useful. We just find yeah. it fun. Gotta love how he just doesn't give a fuck. Yeah, cool guy though. It must, have, must have been a real chill guy. Didn't care. Oh yeah. So, all right, thesis three, it intervenes essentially in two privileged domains, the political domain of the effects of the class struggle and the theoretical domain of the effects of scientific practice. So with that, I also find that to not be a, a false claim. You know, I think that's actually true. Uh, for example, uh, metaphysics is, has a very big effect on you know the kinds of ways we conceive the world and how we think the world should be if you have an individualistic metaphysics for example uh, you find it very easy to be a capitalist and you blame it bl to blame the poor for being poor you know if uh, you are one of those people who inside you know the typical scientist who thinks that science is completely disinterested and uh, you know people are just doing science, you know, that there is no direction to science. Uh, that also masks, you know, the class dynamics and the the bias, the theoretical biases against uh, which aid a certain class struggle in our society, at least. Or, you know, we're, it, it's not, at least to us, uh, the general left, it, it's not anything new to hear, to know that, uh, oh, look, you know, science tends to go wherever the funding goes and the funding goes wherever capitalists think there's anything of interest to them uh, they don't care about uh, just expanding knowledge for the sake of knowledge no they care about expanding knowledge for the sake of profit and is there, if there is no profit even if it is useful uh, they won't put money into it mm -hmm. So there's that, and I think that's actually uh, strangely more more of a problem now than it seems it was ever before in history. Like even in feudalism, like you know, uh, most people were just fucking ignorant. Even the aristocracy, they're just you know they sponsored. Uh, what was it? Well, they were patrons of you know scientists, artisans, crafters, whatever. And, you know, and they, they kind of realize they know their things and we'll just let them do their own things. And unless unless you were doing something like heretical or considered heretical, uh, you were allowed to just pretty much do whatever the hell you were you were doing. Whether it was practical or not, you know, people just... Yeah, it was uh, a lot more frivolous. <laughs> yeah, it was a lot more frivolous. I mean, like, God, uh, Isaac Newton, I mean, the guy spent most of his time just trying to <laughs> transmute... Uh, transmute things, you know, master alchemy. Yeah. yeah. He solved gra he solved physics and he says like, now for magic. Oh, no one yeah. would fund that today. Unless it was like a private person, but no institution would fund that. 
Yeah, and I think it's because, well, back then uh, there wasn't a split between, uh, I think the, the Frankfurt School is very big on this, especially the Adorno, Marcuse, uh, instrumental reason, you know. Uh, things were, if things were instrumental, oftentimes, like science, they were instrumental for not really doing practical things, but literally for spiritual things, you know. You, people really fund them. The average person was interested in alchemy because, oh, you can turn lead into gold. Uh, and the really sophisticated, philosophical, esoteric people, they were interested in alchemy because they were interested in the spiritual aspects of, you know, what does it do to you as a person? The purification of the soul, blah, blah, blah. So, I don't know. I think that that distinction there is is a, a lot more... Uh, pernicious in science today than it was before. But about the whole thing of uh, the class struggle, um, I just don't find that true. Uh, the general dominant philosophy, yes, but for philosophy uh, as a whole, that just doesn't seem true. For example, I mean, just go back to Plato. Plato's Republic and his ideal society was not his society. And he it was totally against the very society he was in. He hated democracy. <laughs> yeah. uh, the same thing for Aristotle. Aristotle was a lot more, uh, a lot more uh, apologetic for his own society. I mean, like the guy had stupid theories about uh, the inferiority of slaves and blah 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 and women. Uh, but even he, like his ideal version of the state, was not the society he lived in. Uh, he admitted to a bit to like society to a, a democracy being some kind of probably the best government because it was the most stable out of them all but it, even he was for something which uh, would be now considered a social democracy of some sort you know something like a full welfare state which was not the society he lived in nor the world he really lived in uh, at all uh, you go to say someone uh, jump forward to say someone like Spinoza and it just the same thing. Like his political views were totally against the very world he was in. Uh, you go back to like the Enlightenment liberals. The world they lived in was not the world. That, the world they theorized it should be was not the world they actually lived in. Uh, so, and, and a lot of the times it had nothing to do with a class struggle that was going on at the time. It was really disconnected from it, and so they had no chance whatsoever finding anybody. Who would really put these things into effect except unless you know you had alexander the great you know uh, go oh wow you know i think aristotle's ideas are really great i'm going to implement them and that's <laughs> the only way it would have happened and even then it wouldn't probably have worked very well <laughs> given the circumstances so i think there's a this doesn't hold true uh, as a general essential truth of, of philosophy uh, yes there's plenty of philosophies which did get bent for the status quo. I mean, obviously, scholasticism was in favor of the whole uh, monarchy, the feudal, the feudal order, the, ch the role of the church, and blah, blah, blah. And nowadays, obviously, we have the liberalism and the sanctity of private property and all these other things. But even, even with that, there's plenty of philosophers, like plenty of philosophers nowadays who are against the order of the current day. And so... You know, in that there is both an explicit uh, yes, like a, a for, you know, say the bourgeoisie, a for the working class, and then there's obviously the people who are in between who are silent about it, and they they think they're being apolitical, but uh, you know we all know that the fact that they're silent about it makes them implicitly for the ruling status quo. So. Uh, pretty good point but uh, obviously I think there are caveats to it uh, for in its essence it is itself produced in the theoretical domain by the conjunction of the effects of the class struggle and the effects of scientific practice hmm. um, I don't think that's quite true. Um, I think in a general, in an overall or overall sense, it is because obviously a 
you know, as science rose, science uh, starts getting brought into uh, into philosophy. You know, with, uh, particularly uh, famously with Descartes. Before him, obviously, there were other people like Bacon and uh, and whatnot. Were um, s- philosophy starts splitting with science, but nonetheless, but nonetheless, even in that split, science gets brought back into the fold of philosophy uh, and uh, you know they, they kind of mutually shape each other uh, and uh, uh, this isn't so noticeable to anybody today except for the people who are working at literally the the so-called cutting edge uh, of every s- scientific field because they're the ones who have to deal with the problems of conceptualization and uh, dealing with those problems they realize that it just isn't that the world is there and just presents itself to you and it's like oh well you know it was just atoms all along no you had to have a theory of atoms you know you had to ha- you had to have a theory that told you that something like that would be there for you to even go look for it you know people weren't just breaking matter up for no fucking reason and likewise you know uh the the science and the theories of science the vulgar theories of science of the day push back on philosophy and get integrated into the uh, <coughs> vulgar philosophies of the day as well. But even then, uh, there is a freedom in philosophy, I think, which just goes far beyond a class struggle and far beyond just common scientific practice. Uh, point is just uh, go look at the German idealist. Uh, if if you think uh, there is some sort of <laughs> class bias going on, uh, it'd be weird. Not that there isn't, but uh, it's not really their interest. Like a lot of these guys are literally just interested in these really out there metaphysics that ultimately have nothing to do with our world except uh, you know once you take them, it does affect the way you view things and the way you're going to theorize about things. So once again, I, I suppose it's the same caveat I have, in which like yes, it's true, but uh, it's I don't think it's technically an a totally essential truth, uh, which infects the whole thing. Uh, Five, it therefore intervenes politically in a theoretical form in the two domains, that of political practice and that of scientific practice. These two domains of intervention being its domains insofar as it is itself produced by the combination effects from these two practices. So I think, uh, obviously here, the the big one for Marxists, uh, political economy. You know, and political economy uh, is not... uh, is um, a pseudoscience, uh, in truth, uh, if you compare it to the so-called hard sciences. And I think that's kind of part, part of what capital, uh, Marx does in capital, uh, proves that this is nothing but a pseudoscience, that it, there is no natural-ness uh, to capitalism, that, you know, that it, it is ingrained in us as a natural law of our biological being or whatever well there's also a reason why when you study economics at a university um it's always separated from anthropology psychology history or uh even political science i mean why are political science and economics two separate fields rather than one combined little question there Yeah, yeah, definitely. So these two domains of intervention being its domains as far as it is itself produced by the combination of effects from these two prizes. Okay. Uh, six, all philosophy expresses a class position, a partisanship in the great debate which dominates the whole history of philosophy, the debate between idealism and materialism. Um, like you said, yeah, it's, it's. I think it's true, but it's not essentially true. It, it's been true in our history because that's a that is our history. 
but uh, as for the you know and uh, obviously many people will disagree here uh, with me and on this position that uh, there is a pure philosophy which has had nothing really to do with uh, favoring any view whatsoever but yeah uh, implicitly pretty much any philosophy that you put nowadays will favor some material position let's say i don't think there is a um, one which favors uh, one class over another, but there there are, for example, and people will say, call me out on this and uh, say whatever they want, but there are literally centrist positions in which, like, you know, uh, they're idealists, <laughs> you know, one might say in, in the bad sense, in which they say, you know, it's kind of like, can't we get along, you know, can't we have the capitalists and the workers, but, you know, just get a, a more equitable uh, distribution yeah. people like bill maher and so on class collaborationism yeah. yeah and so you know are they expressing a partisanship there favoring one class over another um not explicitly kind you know of, one one could yeah. say implicitly you know because of the way the logic really works but even then uh, depending on how like the logic really works so conceivably there is one in which like not really one or the other is, is favored although i think uh, it is undeniable that sis the the logic of say capital undeniably favors the capitalist and anybody who is going to stand upon uh just that as an absolute point and not let go uh, no matter what they say uh, is implicitly you know favoring the, the power of the capitalist So, you know, you could have a, a sock dem and, uh, you know, it's like, uh, you know, we just wanted to be more equitable, equitable but, you know, uh, uh, they're not willing to go the whole way and literally just change society to, to a point in which, you know, the structures of society in, ensure that equity. Uh, you know, they still want to have the private, they still want to, for example, to have uh, high taxes, but they still want to have like the fully private corporation, for example. And uh, uh, here, you know, the, the common Marxist trope of uh, the material side always wins. And in this case, uh, obviously it would. I think it, history proves it. And also, once again, you know, if uh, one stands back and says, well, you know, I'm not going to take sides. Uh, well, you've already taken sides with the status quo then. Which, yeah, the modern day, well, capitalist. So, uh, thesis seven, the Marxist-Leninist revolution in philosophy consists of a rejection of the idealist conception of philosophy. Philosophy as an intercept, interpretation of the world, which denies that philosophy expresses a class position, although it always does so itself. And the adoption of the proletarian class position in philosophy, which is materialist, that is, the inauguration of a new materialist and revolutionary practice of philosophy, which introduces effects of class division in theory. So I think that's just a nice reiteration of all the other prior points. And um, I, I don't know whether Lenin uh, can really put forth that position, but it seems like it doesn't seem too far off for me. Now he's saying all these positions were either explicitly or implicitly uh, contained within material and imperial criticism, right? Or you didn't read that part yet. Sorry, I read it ahead. Yeah. I read ahead. Yeah, then. I've read this <laughs> multiple times before, so. So, uh, once again, uh, where, where he says, you know, uh, the idea is conception of philosophy, that when philosophy is an interpretation of the world, uh, that's bullshit. Uh, that's been bull that was bullshit then, <laughs> it's bullshit yeah. now. Uh, philosophy is not just an interpretation of the world. As a matter of fact, it's very hard to just ever find anyone who's a genuine philosopher that will say oh yeah you know we're just interpreting the world uh, the people who say that are I'm actually the whole, uh, yeah yeah the only the people who, the only people who literally say that are scientists uh, the people who into scientism nowadays yeah. you know it's like you know it's just science the world is there it's just facts philosophers don't say that not any that i know of not any that are good like not any yeah, that people common... really hold in high esteem but there's a common misconception that hegel only interpreted the world because he only cared about looking at things and didn't want to change anything but i think that's false 
Even Zizek seems to hold to that. Because he said uh, to that thesis from Thesis on Feuerbach that Hegel's the only one he could think of that didn't want to change the world. Um, well, see, in that one, I think he's right um, about Hegel. I think Hegel is, a, and um, I've, there's a thing that I read. Uh, I have to find Perhaps it Perhaps he didn't want to change the world himself, but he definitely wanted the world to change. Well, I think, like, there's parts, literally, uh, there was this article I read, it was, uh, I forget whose it was, I gotta find it. But there were quotes which are pretty damning from uh, the philosophy of right, in which it just shows uh, Hegel kind of wasn't even, it wasn't even that he was conservative later in life. He just stopped caring, really. Yeah, maybe. Like, he just thought there was no hope uh, of anybody, like, leading the direction of the world. So for yeah, him, that's how I feel about today. With our so, so when you, he, you know, when, if people claim, oh, you know, Hegel didn't want to change the world, um, kind of true. He he seems to have given up on it by the time he was old. Uh, he was a lot more radical given in his in his early life, definitely. And, his, and it shows in his philosophy. To change. Yeah, but yeah, he I does, still think yeah. He wanted things to change. Okay, well, yeah, he wanted things. Everybody wants things to change. Uh, I don't think like he looked at his world and says like, hey, I'm okay with this. Yeah. But at the same time, he literally does say things. He's like, yeah, the world is what it is. It's always going to be shit. And, you know, the only perfect thing really <laughs> is philosophy. Like, So, I mean, uh, so he gives up. He gives up on any idea that uh, that uh, he'll be doing anything to change the world or that anybody will be doing anything to force the world to change. Uh, I mean, it goes with... It, it is implicit in part in his philosophy in which... Spirit or, you know, history just moves as it does in big aggregate holes. Uh, yeah. No one person really has a hold on it, and no one person can know what's going to take hold. Yeah. So, I don't think we can really blame him, though, because if we watched the French Revolution's potentiality wither away with, the with like, Napoleon's... Uh, subversion then maybe we would be feel the same way yeah and then but there's another sense in which um that's true but also it's not damning at all and 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 i'm glad he held to it which is for hegel hegel says philosophy's business is to know not to know for any purpose but just to know and so the philosopher cannot be interested in one political side or another you know the real quote unquote scientist in like the full sense of the word, both in the regular sense we mean it, as well as the Wissenschaft sense, uh, it has to be dis disinterested. Like, if you want to know the truth, y you can't be interested in messing around with it. Sure, but I don't think uh, we should go around saying that. I mean, we're already criticized as being idealist and we don't want anything to happen. Which is well, not no, that, true. That's not saying that you don't want anything to happen. Yeah. That's saying if you're doing philosophy, you got to do philosophy. Yeah. If you, you're going to get a truth, philosophy. if you're doing philosophy, you do philosophy. You're not going to do philosophy for political purposes. You're not going to do yeah. philosophy for some external purpose. You cannot because then you're not doing philosophy. You're yeah. just being dog uh, dogmatic. That's definitely uh, a point that Kojev makes as well, that you cannot perturb something and then call it truth. Yeah, and you so have find, you have to take it as it is. Yeah, so in that sense, that. in that sense, uh, I'm glad Hegel didn't care about trying to meddle with things, and he just wanted to know, because it is mm -hmm. very important to really know what is there. Uh, you can't be changing things properly if you don't know what there, what is there, nor what is that should be. You know, because uh, you can just go and say, "Oh, well, no." The, the class struggle's moving. Uh, it seems, you know, the next one is the, the proletariat. Therefore, I'm for the proletariat. Well, why? You know, what's good about that? You know, you can uh, talk about progress, but then you'd have to have an idea of a progress. You'd have to have an idea of, like, what it's progressing to and to know that that is a good thing. Because we could just be progressing straight to hell, <laughs> and uh, yeah. that's not a good thing, you know. So anyways... Uh, just a caveat. Uh, like, I'm not saying 
we shouldn't do anything that you know you shouldn't do anything with the philosophy that you know i'm just saying that uh, in as much as one is doing philosophy one does philosophy and it cannot be for any other reason go caveat yeah so all right let's continue reading All these theses can be found in materialism and imperial criticism, either explicitly or implicitly. All I have done is to begin to make them more explicit. Materialism and imperial criticism dates from 1908. At that time, Lenin had not read, or not really read, Hegel. Lenin only read Hegel in 1914 and 1915. We should note that immediately before he read Hegel, the shorter logic, the encyclopedia, then the great logic, and the philosophy of history. Lenin read Feuerbach in 1914. Hence, Lenin read Feuerbach and Hegel in 1914-15, during the first two years of the Inter-Imperialist War, nine years after the crushing of the Revolution of October 1905. At the most critical moment in the history of the workers' movement, the moment of the treachery of the social democratic parties of the Second International, whose practice of a holy alliance in inaugurated the great split, which was to culminate in the... Eh, to culminate in the gigantic work of Lenin and the Bolsheviks in the 1917 revolution and in the foundation of the Third International. Today, in April 1969, we live through a second de facto split in the international communist movement. As the Chinese Communist Party holds its Ninth Congress and as preparations are being made for the International Conference of Communist Parties in Moscow, it is not at all irrelevant to reflect on Lenin in 1914-15, reading Hegel's logic. It is not scholasticism, but philosophy. And since philosophy is politics in theory, it is therefore politics. We have an immense advantage over Lenin in that we are not living in a world war and can see slightly more clearly into the future of the international communist movement. Despite its present split, and perhaps even because of its present split, despite the meagerness of our information about it, for one can always reflect. So, uh, to say that philosophy... Uh, is politics in theory, it is therefore politics. Uh, that's a reduction, and uh, I don't think that's true. <laughs> I think it's true enough for his purposes here, and for Lenin's purposes, but yeah, I agree with you. Well, what he's trying to do is he's trying to, um, I guess you could say, just throw out the whole gap between theory and practice, and that what he's trying to say is that uh, philosophy in itself can be a practice or a political practice because it does have that political element to it. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Can, uh, so with that interpreter, yeah, with that, uh, I agree. Definitely. Although there is uh, something interesting to be said about philosophy and practice, which is uh, not acknowledged by Marxists, but... Uh, I'll leave that for where it's more fit to say. Uh, continuing, the paradox of Lenin's attitude before Hegel can be grasped by contrasting two facts. One, first fact. In 1894, in What the Friends of the People Are, Lenin, who had clearly not read Hegel, but only what Marx says about Hegel in the afterward to the second German edition of Capital, and what Engels says about Hegel and Anti During and Feuerbach and the end of classical German philosophy devotes a dozen pages to the difference between Marx's materialist dialectic and Hegel's dialectic. These 12 pages are a categorical declaration of anti Hegelianism. The conclusion of these 12 pages in a note is, and I quote, the absurdity of accusing Marxism of Hegelian dialectics. End quote. Lenin quotes Marx's declaration that his Quote, method is the direct opposite of Hegel's method, end quote. As for Marx's Hegelian formulations, the very ones which occur in Capital, in particular in Volume 1, Part 1, which Marx himself signaled as the result of his having coquetted with the modes of expression peculiar to Hegel, Lenin settles accounts with them by saying that they are Marx's manner of expression and relate to the origin of the doctrine, adding with much common sense that the theory should not be blamed for its origin. Lenin goes on to say that the Hegelian formulations of dialectic, the empty dialectical scheme of the triads, is a lid or a skin, 
And not only can one remove the slit or skin without changing anything in the bowl uncovered or the fruit peeled, but indeed they must be uncovered or peeled in order to see what is in them. So, uh, interesting. You know, in that, uh, I'm actually quite sympathetic to Lenin. <laughs> because I think a lot of Marxists would do better to have that kind of attitude than uh, the one they have now about dialectics, in which they don't understand them, but they slavishly glorify them and uh, attempt to uselessly Sorry, use you're them. you're cutting out a little. What did you say? I was saying that I agree with Lenin here. His, uh, yeah. I'm sympathetic to his position here because I feel it's actually be a better position that if you don't understand dialectics, it's better to have that position of getting rid of it and uh, considering it useless than actually slavishly uh, wanting to reproduce it and uh, just glorifying it without understanding it and uh, using it for uh, trying to formulate stupid things. Yeah, that's what I was telling some people today. Yeah. Continuing, may I remind the reader that in 1894 Len had not read Hegel, but he had read Marx's Capital very closely and understood it better than anyone else ever had. He was 24, so much so that the best introduction to Marx's Capital is to be found in Lenin, which would seem to prove that the best way to understand Hegel and the relation between Marx and Hegel is above all to have read and understood Capital. Well, I don't know about Lenin, because I haven't read his introduction to Capital or if he has one, but uh, I definitely agree yeah, with that does. sentiment that uh, capital is the way to see the relationship. Yeah, I agree. So, two. Second fact. In 1915, in his notes on the great logic, Lenin wrote a statement which everyone knows by heart in which I quote, Aphorism. It is impossible completely to understand Marx's capital, and especially its first chapter, without having thoroughly studied and understood the whole of Hegel's logic. Consequently, half a century later, none of the Marxists understood Marx. Yep, famous quote. For any superficial reader, this statement obviously contradicts the statements of 1894, since instead of radical anti-Hegelian declarations, here we seem to have a radical pro-Hegelian declaration. Indeed, it goes so far that, if it were applied to Lenin himself as the author of remarkable texts on capital, written between 1893 and 1905, he would appear as not having understood Marx, since before 1914 and 1915, Lenin had not thoroughly studied and understood the whole of Hegel's logic. Well, I shall leave true. the... Well, uh... I mean, logically, it works. Well, yeah, log logically. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> Um, I think one can understand capital very well without understanding Hegel's logic, but yeah. Um, and here, well, but the impetus of why capital has the use of Hegel's logic at all uh, can't be understood without obviously understanding Hegel's logic. Yeah, and this aphorism is probably the reason why everyone says. Don't start on Capital, start on Hegel. But to understand Hegel, you have to read out every philosopher before him and so on. And it's just not all that necessary. You should read other philosophers because you want to, not because you want to get to Marx. Yeah, philosophy being read for instrumental ends won't get you much of anywhere. So, continuing... I shall leave the conventional commentators to extricate, them, to extricate themselves from this little contradiction, but I doubt whether they will make much progress with it, however much they declare, as good commentators on other texts of Lenin's, that contradiction is the universal motor of all progress, including the progress of understanding. So I guess he's uh, making fun of people who says like, yeah, he, he, who believe that he contradicted himself, but then go ahead and save the contradiction by saying, hey, look, uh, that's dialectics, yeah. isn't it? <laughs> Hegel, Hegelian point, yeah. Very good. Which, by the way, uh, I agree, that is dialectics. Uh, literally. Uh, just mm -hmm. throwing it out there 
for anybody who uh, thinks Hegel's logic is some weird thing, uh, it's literally the logic of learning. Uh, the way you learn and self-correct, that's dialectics. You heard it here. Um, I'll actually, I was, I am uh, in the middle of uh, writing something on that. So continuing, for myself, I state that I subscribe word for word to the second declaration of Lenin's just as I do to the first. I shall explain this directly. Lenin was quite right to say that to understand capital, and especially as he has the genius to point out, its first chapter, that is, the Extraordinary Volume 1, Part 1, extraordinary because it is still Hegelian, not only in its terminology, but also in its order of exposition. It is essential to know Hegel's logic through and through, and for good reason. I can reduce the paradox of this second fact, of this second declaration of Lenin straight away, by pointing out that it is preceded, a page earlier in the notebooks, by another very interesting formula only a few lines before. Lenin declares, in fact, that Quote, Hegel's analysis of syllogisms recalls Marx's imitation of Hegel in chapter 1. This is a rephrasing of Marx's own diagnosis, his coquetting with Hegel. If the cap fits, wear it. This is not me speaking, but Lenin following Marx. In fact, one cannot understand volume 1, part 1 at all without completely removing its Hegelian lid, without reading it as, without reading as a materialist, as Hegel... <laughs> Without reading as a materialist, as Lenin reads Hegel, the said volume 1, part 1, without, if you will forgive the presumption, rewriting it. So, um, um, I'm not quite sure about that, uh, you know, that one cannot read, understand volume 1, part 1 at all without completely removing its Hegelian lid. Uh, because hmm. really, uh, most people read it fine without it. They never had the lid to begin with. Yeah. Well, that's the point I think he's trying to make. That's that's the whole point he's trying to make, that he didn't understand it uh, at first because he didn't... Or he understood it at first because he didn't have Hegel. But then when he ha had Hegel, he had to remove the Hegel to understand it again. That's the mm. point he was trying to make. Yeah. But I like the last part because it implies that you have to rewrite Capital. And uh, since Winfield did that, uh, does that mean he <laughs> understands? <laughs> <laughs> God damn it. Uh, yeah, for anybody listening, uh, there's two. There's two have done it. Uh, there is David P. Levine basically rewrote Capital, uh, all three volumes. So. Uh, with a complete Hegelian systematization. And uh, Winfield just kind of re-updated and uh, followed up on what Levine did. Uh, Hegelian Marx... Marxist Hegelians, let's call it that way. Yeah. Uh, only insofar as... Uh, Marxish. Yeah, Marxish. Only insofar as uh, they think the theory is good, though not in Marxist form. Uh, but I'm not quite sure I agree with uh, Althusser here. Now, I don't think one can. Re I don't think that if you remove Hegel uh, from Capital, you really have anything special left at all. Because uh, part of what the the impetus of the Hegelian core of Capital, the, the structure of the theory around that, and the fact that it can be structured that way, is actually part of what I think uh, is shown in a lot of private mail by Marx that he thinks that's exactly what is most important that the fact that it works that way is a really important thing about it it shows something and particularly it shows the absolute necessity that the system works the way it does that it's not just Marx uh, you know putting it as he sees it but Marx thinks he's got the real thing he's seen how it it really is do you have any opinion on this whole idea of reading Hegel as a materialist? Or do you think that's just another misunderstanding? Uh, no, I think it works. Uh, obviously, it's one-sided, but it works. I mean, when I first read the phenomenology, uh, just straight up, like I, 
I went in with no reading guides nor anything. Like all I had read before that was uh, an occasional article overview, which I had no idea what the hell they were saying. But I tried. But then I got to the phenomenology, and as I was reading it, it blew me away because I thought this is materialism right here. Like just reading the first section up to the master slave, uh, the end of the master slave, I thought that was absolutely uh, ingenious. And to me, it seemed to be absolutely materialist. And I was baffled because everyone says, like, oh, this guy's the idealist and uh, it doesn't apply to the world. I'm like, well, what are you talking about? <laughs> well. So, yeah, it can be done. I think uh, uh, people should do it. Uh, you know, even if you uh, uh, don't like the idealism part, and by the way, I just uh, always to harp on it. Uh, Hegel's idealism isn't what people think it is. Uh, he's not Plato, mm -hmm. and even even Plato isn't Plato, by the way, uh, according to mm -hmm. the common myths of Plato. So, um, for me, it's yeah, you know, if if it made people read Hegel, it'd be great. Uh, and it's a, uh, I think you know, Zizek, for example, it's it's not too bad of a reading. I don't think it's Hegel as Hegel, but it's a uh, not that much more of a bastardization of Hegel. <laughs> let's just say. Uh I mean, I know this quote is out of context, but somewhere Zizek actually said that Hegel was more materialist than Marx. Um, I, I mean, would it, agree. It's completely out of context, I know, but... Well, I would agree insofar that uh, Hegel takes in a lot more of, uh, of the concreteness uh, on a conceptual level of reality than Marx does. I mean, Marx, is, Marx gets ultimately really bogged down in the whole figuring out the the political economy stuff. So he never gets around to like fully fleshing out a decent theory of everything else that he needed. A decent theory of the anthropology. A decent theory of the state. A decent theory of like so of society in general. The only one he really nails down uh, to a satisfactory systematic level is the theory of capital and the stuff that we can get uh, derived from that. Uh, whereas Hegel just Hegel goes really wide, and uh, even though he obviously he's nowhere near as detailed as he needs to be, uh, he still captures things which are absolutely important to understand uh, for understanding. All right, continuing. This brings us directly to my central thesis on Lenin's reading of Hegel. That is that in his notes on Hegel, Lenin maintains precisely the position he had adopted previously in What the Friends of the People Are and Materialism and Imperial Criticism, that is, at a moment when he had not read Hegel, which leads us to a shocking but correct conclusion. Basically, Lenin did not need to read Hegel in order to understand him, because he had already understood Hegel, having closely read and understood Marx. Marx. Bearing this in mind, Yeah, you uh, you just disconnected. Are yeah. you still recording? Uh, yeah. Okay. Let me. And restart. what we recorded before uh, wasn't lost. No. Okay. It was just mumble. Got disconnected. Goddamn Comcast. Ah. All right. Let me just restart that uh, that paragraph. This brings us directly to my central thesis on Lenin's reading of Hegel. That is, that in his notes on Hegel, Lenin maintains precisely the position he had adopted previously in What the Friends of the People Are and Materialism and Imperial Criticism. That is, at a moment when he had not read Hegel, which leads us to a shocking but correct conclusion. Basically, Lenin did not need, <laughs> did not need to read Hegel in order to understand him because he had already understood Hegel, having closely read and understood Marx. Bearing this in mind, I shall hazard a peremptory, eh, peremptory aphorism of my own. A century and a half later, no one has understood Hegel because it is impossible to understand Hegel without having thoroughly studied and understood capital. Provocation for provocation. I hope I shall be forgiven this one, at least in the Marxist camp. Okay, so it wasn't as I suspected. He meant it in the opposite sense that you can't understand Hegel without having read Marx or Capital. Right, Capital makes Hegel clear. I think we can disagree with this, but... 
Absolutely, because let me tell you, even though like one could, in theory, at reading any dialectical work, figure out dialectics, uh, capital is not one of them. And the reason why is because there is an external logical infection in capital, which is unfortunate. And it starts right there with the labor theory of value. Uh, yeah. Marx breaks the logic. And if, if you had at least the intuition that what you should do is find a way to piece this together, uh, you would be pretty much having to spin circles trying to figure out how you're going to get the direct logical link to la the labor theory of value from uh, value. Uh, so you'd miss out on those things. You'd have this whole, you'd have these sections of smooth theory and then you'd have this really jarring break in which whole, this is here, you know, apparently Marx knew what he was doing. Either I'm an idiot or, you know, this doesn't work. And most people will instead assume that they're, they don't get it instead of assuming that Marx gets it wrong. But, uh, yeah, don't agree with that. Completely wrong. If you want to understand Hegel, <laughs> read the logic. Uh, if you can't get that, I don't know how one could ever get it uh, any clearer. Yeah. Well, I mean, there are clearer ways. It could be more concrete. Well, but uh, I think it's the, the whole really abstract form of the logic makes it just so in your f as in your face as it could possibly be, uh, despite Hegel not telling you about it. Because uh, he just tells you, I can't tell you about it, buddy. So I'm not gonna, <laughs> I'm not gonna try. But you'll figure it out, right? Most people don't. It's the same thing. Uh, uh, I read Capital. Uh, I read it almost twice completely. Uh, I I did not understand what the hell dialectics were in, in those two times I read it. And it's it's mm -hmm. what really bothered me. It's the reason I ended up reading Hegel, because I really, really wanted to know what the hell dialectics were. And uh, Marxists were not making it anything clear. Continuing, as for the Hegelians, they can carry on with their philosophical rumination in Hegel, ruminator of all ruminations. That is the interpreter. The interpreter of all the interpretations of the in the history of philosophy, at any rate, as good Hegelians, they know that history is over and that therefore they can only go round and round within the theory of the end of history. That is in Hegel. Well, they sure can. <laughs> and I mean, it's yeah, a good it's, it's a it's a it's a good <laughs> criticism, though. I mean, like, yeah. let's be honest. Uh, Look at most Hegelian scholarship. Uh, as a matter of fact, being honest about most Marxist scholarship, what is it really? It's just going round and round the same thing. Uh, no advancements whatsoever, really. Mm -hmm. uh, the advancements that there are in Marxism that go into post-Marxism are not really for what Marxism originally intended, so they're kind of counter-Marxist in, in their own sense as well. You know, they end up being, guess what, exactly the thing, trying to understand the world rather than change it. You know, like Zizek's own post-Marxism is, well, you know, adding in Lacan, bringing back in Hegel. Why? Well, you know, his, uh, Zizek's famous uh, controversial claim that, you know, now now is the time for theory uh, to learn what the hell the world is going on in the world rather than obsessively trying to change it without knowing what the hell is going on. Yeah. Uh, but uh, uh, all to say it was actually a post-Marxist as well. I mean, he had his own ver variation of post-Marxism. Yeah, yeah, structuralism. But no post-Marxist, uh, really worth their salt, considers themselves post-Marxist. You just consider them the real <laughs> themselves, the real Marxists, you know. Yeah, only but, a yeah. name to maybe distance themselves from previous Marxists. Yeah, yeah. So. Uh, I mean, that's not so much of a problem with, like, the Marxist left. Uh, well, actually, no. It is a problem with the Marxist left <laughs> for a lot of things. Uh, a, well, lo a lot of can, going circles. They uh, they consider their theories to be advanced. You see that word thrown around a lot. Yeah, and uh, if you look at Hegel's scholarship, you know, the the, the attack is uh, pretty dang true. A lot, a lot of uh, Hegelian scholarship uh, is just 
it, it's worse than Marxist scholarship because like they go in circles even more than than Marxists, mainly because they have a, a lot more to to think about. But it's it's almost it's pretty much non-existent that anyone actually advances Hegelianism at all. The only one I know is Winfield that uh, tries to bring that to the present, and not only just bring it to the present, but tries to go ahead beyond uh, to concretize it further. Because I think it can office. be. Well, it can Because I think, in, yeah, <laughs> besides that, yeah. literally, a, a practical Hegelian, take that, you Marxist. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so called. Yeah. Yeah, right. Uh, they'll just go and say, like, sock them, uh, liberal, you know, thinking he can work within the system. That's not practice. You know, practice is organizations, blah, blah, blah. Well, excuse us. By any means necessary. Yeah. So continuing, after all, it is not just roundabouts that go round and round. Uh, the wheel of history can go round and round too. The wheel of philosophical history, at least, which always goes round and round. And when it is Hegelian, it's advantage, like the advantage Pascal attributed to man over the reed, is that it knows it. What, when, I think that was then, what then was so interesting to Lenin in Hegel's great logic? In order to answer this question, we must first re learn to read Lenin's notes in his reading of Hegel. This is a truism, but one from which, of course, hardly anyone draws necessary but elementary conclusions. We have to believe that none of the commentators of the notebooks on Hegel have ever themselves kept a book of notes in their own individual reading. For when one takes notes, there are notes whose functions it is to summarize what one has just read, and there are notes whose function it is to assess what one has just read. There are also notes that one takes and notes that one does not take. For example, those who are prepared to compare the text of Hegel's great logic with the text of Lenin's notes cannot fail to observe that Lenin almost completely ignores the book on being leaving hardly any comment on it other than summarizing notes. This is surely strange, that is, symptomatic. These same readers cannot fail to remark that the notes become abundant, and not just the summarizing notes, but also the critical notes, usually approving but occasionally disapproving. When Lenin comes to the book, on essence, which clearly interests him considerably, and that Lenin's notes become very abundant for the book devoted, devoted to subjective logic and very laudatory, on the absolute idea, the chapter on which Lenin, amazingly though it may seem, regards as practically materialist. I cannot go into all the details, although they are essential, but I attach the greatest importance to a critical, that is, a materialist, reading of Lenin's notes on his reading of Hegel, in order first to say how Lenin reads Hegel, then to say what primarily interests him in Hegel, and finally to attempt to say why. And in that, uh, I'm not surprised, actually. Not surprised at all uh, that Lenin did not really make any examining uh, remarks on the logic of being. Uh, mainly because it is, the most, it is the most abstract uh, part of the logic. Uh, it begins in its, the highest point of abstraction. It's, it gets developed to a point of generality in which really, if one really thought that way, there wouldn't be that much of interest to say. It's literally about the surface logic of things. Uh, it's pre-scientific uh, understanding, comprehension of things. I mean, literally, being, it's just about qualities, the ways we notice qualities, the ways qualities can be understood, the ways quantities, measures, etc. I mean, that's the very, that's the most basic things we as human beings in our everyday lives nowadays just know, uh, not just as adults. I mean, we just the first things we come to know as children, you know, quantification comes easy, though we don't have to learn it as numbers, for example, but uh, qualification as well, you know, immediacy of objects, blah, blah, blah. Nothing of interest, like, for regular science, let alone philosophical, you know, science uh, is, is really there although I think if one understands it deeply uh, you can definitely bring that to bear on a ton of things so um, the stuff on essence uh, essential relationships are basically 
uh, relationships of uh, if then kind of things, you know, cause and effect, essence and appearance. If you have an essence, you got to have an appearance. So if you have an appearance, obviously, has to be in a, there has to be an essence. All these kinds of relationships are ground and grounded, which are basically, it's where the bulk, and by bulk, I mean like somewhere like 99% of our, our mature thinking goes to. Like most of the time, we're thinking in relations of essence rather than relations of being, as well as relations of the concept. All right, uh, should we keep going? One more section? Yes. All right. We're about halfway through the essay, so I don't know if you want to complete it or just leave it at that. Uh, we'll finish up this section because uh, people get bored. I see. We can continue this uh, tomorrow. So section one, uh, apparently that was just a preface. <laughs> How Lenin read Hegel. He read Hegel, and the phrase constantly recurs, as a materialist. What does this phrase mean? First, it means that Lenin read Hegel by inverting him. What does this inversion mean? Simply the inversion of idealism into materialism. But beware! In practice, this means not that Lenin put matter in place of the idea and vice versa, for that would merely produce a new materialist metaphysics that is, a materialist variant of classical philosophy, say, at best, a mechanistic materialism. But that for his reading of Hegel, Lenin adopted a proletarian class viewpoint, a dialectical materialist viewpoint, which is something quite different. Uh, so, uh, what I understand from that is uh, Lenin didn't read it to come up with a metaphysics. He just read it for what's useful in this. You know, well, he read it mm. to understand uh, the movement of history, if I recall correctly. Or he read it rather to understand the role of um, individuals in history. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. So it's a it's a version of what's useful in this. You know, uh, he had an idea of what he wanted to know. He wanted to know how he could use this to know what he wanted to know. Which is, you know, it's not a, a bad thing to do. I, I think people. The fact that he even did it just shows the amazing intellect Lenin had. I mean, it, one has to be very intellectually adept and curious to go to these lengths to understand things. So, continuing. In other words, Lenin did not read Hegel in order to set Hegel's absolute idealist system back on, back on its feet in the form of a, of a materialist system. For his reading of Hegel, he adopted a new philosophical practice, a practice which followed from the proletarian class viewpoint, that is, from the dialectical materialist viewpoint. What interested Lenin in Hegel was above all the effects of this dialectical materialist reading of Hegel, that is, the effects produced with respect to a reading of passages from Hegel which deal primarily with what is called the theory of knowledge and the dialectic. If Lenin did not read Hegel according to the method of inversion, how did he read him? Precisely according to the method he described as early as 1894 in What the Friends of the People Are, with respect to the reading of Capital, Volume 1, Part 1, by the method of laying bare, what is valid for the reading of passages from Marx contaminated by Hegelian terminology and the Hegelian order of exposition in Capital is obviously valid a fortiori, a hundred times a fortiori, for Hegel himself. Hence the radical laying bare, a central passage in the mo in the notebooks says this in so many words. Movement and self-movement. This, nota bene, arbitrary, independent, spontaneous, internally necessary movement, change, movement and vitality, the principle of all self-movement, impulse, treb, to movement and to activity, the opposite to dead being, who would believe that this is the core of Hegelianism, of abstract and abstrusion, ponderous, absurd, Hegelianism? This core had to be discovered, understood. I don't know how to say that since German. In Uberatten. In Uberatten. In Uberatten. 
In Überetten. Ja, Rübel. Über. In Überetten. <lacht> Laid bare, refined, which is precisely what Marx and Engels did. Well, I mean, it's like good on Engels to catch on that. Mm -hmm. uh, although I don't know why he thinks that's not exactly what Hegel meant uh, already. Well, I mean, I, I guess I know why he thinks like, he didn't already. Uh, the metaphysical reading of Hegel as in, like, you know, the theological stuff, like uh, who Hegel thinks that there is a thing called the absolute idea that's God out there. Uh, that was a pretty common interpretation back in the day. Which uh, Hegel himself is to blame for. Because uh, in order to keep himself in a job, he lied in his own theology lectures about what his philosophy implied about shit. But we know, we know you're lying, Hegel. Continuing, what are we to understand by this metaphor of laying bare, refining, or extraction, a term used elsewhere, if not the image that there is in Hegel something like a rational kernel which must be rid of its skin, or better, no doubt, of its superimposed skins, in short of a certain crust which is more or less thick, thick of a fruit and onion, Oh, think of a fruit of an onion or even an artichoke. I don't know why people like artichokes. I mean, like, they're tasteless things. <laughs> I, I mean, know, like, I, I, like so. I like artichoke dip, by the way. It's just... I love artichokes. Uh, maybe I just haven't had them in, in a, a good dish. But like, on their own. Correctly. On their own, it's just like, eh. He's just talking about getting rid of the skin, right? Not having layers or anything. Yeah, you know, just bare the, bear the bones. Mm. Hence, the extraction needs to be laboriously laid bare. Sometimes, as in the chapter on the absolute idea, the materialist kernel reaches almost to the surface. A mere laying bare is enough. Sometimes the skin is thick. It is tangled with the kernel itself, and the kernel needs to be disentangled. Yeah. Notice it's funny he doesn't give an example of this um, because I'll just tell you there is no example of this. Like The logic is as bare as you can fucking get it. <laughs> it is. Uh, he, Hegel even tells you, look, I don't mean anything special by any of these things. Like What is on the paper, that is what it means. Th there really is no more depth to be had other than the investigation itself. So, uh, when you just flip open to the pa a page in the, ch the logic of essence, uh, there's nothing more to be said on that except, of course, you'd have to know uh, where it came from. That's the only laying bare you got to do to know how it is that the investigation even got to that point. But uh, every other point of the investigation is it's a buildup. If you start from the beginning, there is nothing to lay bare except for the fact of where is this going? I don't know. So sometimes the skin is thick, it is tangled with the kernel itself, and the kernel needs to be disentangled. In either case, a labor involving more or less a transformation is necessary. Sometimes there is only skin, nothing at all to retain, everything has to be discarded, there is no rational kernel. No example. Thus, in the book of the, the book of the great logic on being, in all, in all the passages contained directly or indirectly what Lenin calls mysticism, for example, where logic is alienated into nature, Lenin writes furiously, stupidity, foolishness, incredible. And he rejects <laughs> outright nonsense, absolute nonsense. I am in general trying to read Hegel materialistically. Hegel is materialism which has been stood on its head, according to Engels, that is to say, I cast aside for the most part God, the absolute, the pure idea, etc. Well, yeah. I mean, I can understand why you, why you thought that. Uh, the, the passage mm. there is uh, is considered, the passage of the logic to nature is considered uh, definitely one of those places in which uh, it's not very clear what is meant. I think, though, that if you've gotten the method up to that point and you understood it, you know what is meant. Because uh, Hegel literally says it in a very theological, metaphorical way. And he says, oh, you know, and now the idea releases itself freely into nature. Oh. Sounds pretty spooky, right? Uh, 
it actually isn't if you understood like what the hell was going on every in everything prior it's, it's just another version of a dialectics <laughs> hey you got the absolute idea well what's the opposite of the idea you you've got the absolute idea the idea that thinks itself uh, what could be the op opposed to it you know well it's an idea well it's the opposite of idea an idea and as you know an idea opposed to an idea well how can that be possible in an absolute idea uh, well the only way is to have it <laughs> the absolute idea outside of itself and how how does that happen well you got to get nature something that is not an idea but that is me getting into autistic things which uh, make no sense to you the listener but uh, that is that Continuing, thus a rather special method. The inversion is simply an affirmation of the partisan position of the proletariat in philosophy, the inversion of idealism into materialism. The real operation, the real work of materialist reading consists of a quite different operation. 1. The rejection of a mass of propositions and theses with which nothing can be done, from which absolutely nothing can be obtained, skins without kernels. 2. The retention of a certain well-chosen fruits and vegetables and their careful peeling or the disentanglement of their kernels from their thick skins, tangled with the kernel by real transforming work. Quote, One must first of all extract the materialist dialectics from it, the Hegelian uh, galamatias, I don't know what the hell it is. It must be some kind of fruit or something, or some special yeah, kind of corn. Nine-tenths of it, however, is chaff. Rubbish. Apparently so, it's a contemporary singer. I, don't, yeah. <laughs> I looked it up. <laughs> so, um... I mean, here I think the... Is the... Uh, the confusing. Yeah, go ahead. Confu confusing or in uh, unintelligible talk is Galam uh, Galamatia. Ah, uh, so babble. Or gibberish, yeah. gibberish. That's Galamach Galamachias. 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 Sounds like a flower. Yeah. I'm going to go pick some Galamachias. Yeah. So, obviously, here is... I'm starting to have deep disagreements. I know what he's talking about, so I'm, I'm not saying, like, oh, he's an idiot. According to his own principle, it's fine. But uh, it, what he's saying about uh, Hegelianism, though, I just think is beginning to become very clearly false in a very very big way in which uh, there's this idea that somehow you get to the absolute idea and you find oh the real materialist kernel in all of Hegel which is the method because that's by the way that's what the absolute the chapter in the absolute idea is it's about the method the the actual dialectical method which he couldn't tell us about the beginning because <laughs> it's the, the absolute idea it's how thought thinks itself yeah uh, but then he says, you know, uh, the inversion is simply, here's another issue, uh, the inversion is simply an affirmation of the partisan position of the proletariat in philosophy, the inversion of idealism into materialism. Uh, by what criterion he names this idealism and the other one just because, oh, he's a proletarian, there's, you know, it's, it's, it's materialism. I, I don't yeah. get it. I mean, I really don't get it. Uh, it's kind of an arbitrary thing. I know what he, I know what he's trying to say, what he's implying, but the words don't make sense really when you really try to philosophically consider them. And of course, uh, you know, the author would say, "Well, exactly, you're a stupid philosopher. We're not philosophers. We just told you." <laughs> In which case, fine, fine, whatever, whatever, man. Uh, words mean whatever you want them to mean. It's cool. So, uh, the point one, the rejection of a mass propositions of a mass of propositions and theses which nothing can be done, from which absolutely nothing can be obtained, skins without kernels. Well, uh, just read Hegel. The, Hegel does not work with propositional logic. He doesn't just say theses. Uh, he doesn't have axioms. It's what makes him so goddamn awful for people to begin with because they're used to that kind of thing. So, you know, oh, Hegel just makes these propositions. Well, no, he doesn't. <laughs> Everything, everything's you know made with this really tight conceptual connections, and it's really hard to break through and, and break into. And but uh, once you do, it's like wow, it's like swimming in water. 
And the second one is, to me, I, I see it, and this is Mao, I feel. Like, this reminds uh-huh. me of Mao. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Because uh, you told me that he likes Mao, and I, I didn't know that. Yes. Yes. But... Um, uh, you could interpret a lot of Althusser's interpretation of Marx through the lens of Mao. That what Althusser was trying to do by stripping away Marx of the Hegelian elements and insisting that Marx thought this way, um, I mean, you could interpret that as a defense of Mao. Like how Mao was uh, stepping outside the orthodoxy, but Althusser says, no, um, Mao is the orthodoxy. It's just that, you know, that this, all this Hegelian stuff kind of clouds the whole, that whole interpretation. Sorry, that came out really sloppy, but... That Hegel's, like the, Marx taking Hegel uh, clouds his project? Or uh, Or reading Marx as influenced by, yeah, as Hegelian, yeah, yeah, distorts what, um, because I don't know if you're familiar with the whole epistemological break theory that, or that uh, Althusser came up with and was heavily mm-hmm. scrutinized for, uh, that Marx was no longer Hegelian after a certain point. Oh. And, uh, yeah. Yeah, and the reason I say, like, uh, I think this is Mao is because it, this reminds, like, this whole thing, you know, the retention of a certain well-chosen fruits and vegetables and the careful peeling and disentangling of the kernels, blah, blah, blah. I mean, it, it's... The big thing that really comes out when Mao, like above everyone else, I think, is pragmatism, like the supremacy of, of practice and like screw whatever just pure theory says that, you know, we're not moralists, we're not idealists, you know, we're not metaphysicians, we'll do whatever it takes to make this work, to make this happen. And so, you know, you pick and choose what is going to be useful to you and you don't hold it. And once it's not useful, you throw it away. And insofar as it's not useful, you, you know, it's just chaff. You don't bother with it. Because without taking that kind of stance, really, everything... Uh, everything in Hegel just can't, uh, uh, can't be interpreted along this lines because uh, it's quite intelligible. Um, I should know. I fucking did it from nothing. Yep. Uh, so it can be, it does make sense. It's not unintelligible nonsense. It's not non-applicable. It's very abstract, but it's still applicable. Uh, it's just not a, like, for example, what I was saying, this stuff about the logic of being, yeah, you're not going to be applying that to practice because it really doesn't have any applicability except for, uh, like, not a political practice, but, uh, well, actually, crap, no, I'm, I take that back. No, even then it's a, a, applicable. It's, it's a part of cognition. Um, if you want to know what I'm talking about, uh, read Andy Blunden. He has an essay. He has an essay on the the logic of Hegel's concepts. I think that's close to the title, but you can just look his look him up on uh, academia.edu. Um, he shows how uh, everything in the logic really really functions concretely, yeah. and uh, you know. Uh, he's an Ile- he's a, a Leninist. Uh, he's he's very favorable to Ilienko specifically. So uh, you know that 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 accusation is not does not hold water even amongst uh, Marx well certain Marxists at least who are philosophically uh, inclined. Then again, of course, we also see and contend against like well, exactly, we're not philosophers. <laughs> we don't want to be. So, continuing. What a waste. This has nothing to do with a miraculous inversion. Part 2. Or Section 2. What is it that interests Lenin? Oh, I thought we were only reading the first section. Well, no, that was a short. I thought it was longer. Oh, okay. What is it that Lenin retains from Hegel and reworks? Here I could go on forever. 
I shall group my points under the two chapter headings which are the most important in my eyes, and I believe in the eyes of every careful reader of the notebooks. The first deals with Hegel's criticisms of Kant, the second with a chapter on the absolute idea. Is it? Mm. Yeah. Yeah. It's the rest of the article. Oh. Well, I don't know. If, uh, if, uh, uh, we can probably get to at least the end of the criticism of Kant. Okay. So, A, Hegel's criticism of Kant. This never fails. Whenever Lenin finds a criticism of Kant in Hegel's text, he approves, and especially when Hegel criticizes the Kantian notion of the thing in itself as unknowable. Then Lenin's approval was categorical and even lyrical. Essentially, Hegel is completely right as opposed to Kant. Thought proceeding from the concrete to the abstract does not get away from the truth but comes closer to it. The abstraction of matter, of a law of nature, the abstraction of value, etc., in short, all scientific, correct, serious, not absurd, abstractions reflect nature more deeply, truly, and completely. From living perception to abstract thought, and from this to practice, such as the dialectical path of the cognition of truth, of the cognition of objective reality, Kant disparages knowledge in order to make way for faith. Hegel exalts knowledge, asserting that knowledge is knowledge of God. The materialist exalts the knowledge of matter, of nature, consigning God and the philosophical rabble that defends God to the rubbish heap. Here, Lenin is merely repeating Engels. In addition, there is yet a set of different philosophers, those who question the possibility of any cognition, or at least of an exhaustive cognition of the world. To them, among the more modern ones, belong Hume and Kant, and they have played a very different role in the philosophical development. What is decisive... Uh, they have played a very important role, yeah. And they have played a very important role in philosophical development. What is decisive in the refutation of this view has already been said by Hegel insofar as it was possible from an idealist standpoint. Yeah, that was quoting Engels. By the way, uh, Engel, Engel's acceptance of that critique is uh, is horrible. Uh, <laughs> I think in Dialectics of Nature, he, he tries to make his own critique in which he says, uh, of course Kant is wrong, it, like just by pra the practice refutes him because, well, look, science is possible. You know, we thought uh, that, uh, say, you know... Uh, rocks were impossible and then we find out oh no there's minerals and then we thought that was unknowable and we said oh you know it's atoms and you know, then we went to quantum physics and whatnot and so you know we we broke through and we found we found out what was inside the thing in itself well we know what was the thing in itself which is uh completely missing the point of kant by the way which is uh, which is uh that the relationship of thought to things is mediated by uh, necessary perceptions, which are only explainable as perceptions of our minds, you know, projections of our own minds, according to him. You know, things enter a certain form within our minds, and then we see them, they are representations. Mm -hmm. So we only know representations, but not the things which are represented. And, uh, Lenin himself falls into that imperial criticism. He has a horrible theory, which comes straight from Engels, which takes Engels on criticism just for that. Uh, he has the reflection, the mirror theory of knowledge, in which, what do you mean? The, the things in our minds are just literally reflections of the material things in the world. Which is a pre-Kantian dogmatic, dogmatic uh, position. But but it's good that he finally read Hegel and uh, learned the good critique. Albeit uh, Hegel's explanation of that critique is not quite uh, what Lenin is saying there. But uh, I'll not go into that. It's autistic. Well, never mind. I'll go into that. I like the autism. <laughs> it's very quick, too. 
it's very quick. Like Hegel's basic critique of the thing in itself is like, well, what, how do you know there's a thing in itself? Well, it's a thing in itself relation to you, right? Right. And he says, there yeah. you go. There you go. It's not really a thing in itself. It's a thing in itself for you. So it's not fully this independent thing. It's already caught in the matrix of the ways you know it and the ways it's present to you. So whatever the thing in itself is in itself ultimately has to be whatever it is possible for it to be to you. As an object of consciousness. Yep, so we're related to things, therefore, yes, there are things are themselves in themselves, but they are themselves in themselves only because they are for us. Yeah, if because if there was no something to observe it. Yeah, because otherwise if the, it's just a thing floating around or Yeah, or it around. wouldn't it wouldn't even be a thing because his his critique is even more radical. It's like if there's yeah. an inside, there's gotta be an outside. So if there's I'm just an inside itself... be... <laughs> Yeah, it's normie. basically it's basically that. The normie version of it is there's an inside, there's gotta be an outside. So, you know, there there is no uh, broken link there. Yeah. So, continuing. How are we to interpret this attitude? We should note carefully that when Lenin approves of the fact that Hegel criticizes Kant from the Hegelian viewpoint, he certainly does not approve the Hegelian viewpoint 100%. But he does approve 100% of the fact that Kant is criticized, and let us say approves, of a large part of the arguments behind Hegel's criticism of Kant. This is really an obvious point. It is possible for two people to be in agreement against a third, par a third party for different reasons, more or less different reasons. And, uh, um. Continuing, for Lenin, as for Hegel, Kant means subjectivism. In a quasi-Hegelian phrase, Lenin says that the transcendental is subjectivism in psychology. And naturally, we are not surprised to find that Lenin occasionally compares Kant with Mach. Hence, Lenin is in agreement with Hegel in criticizing Kant from the, viewpoint, from the point of view of objectivism. But what objectivism? We shall see. In any case, he delights in Hegel's criticism of the thing in itself. An empty notion, he says, in agreement with the Hegelian formulation. It is a myth to claim to be able to think the unknowable, the thing in itself, is the identity of the essence in the phenomenon. So, yeah, put it more normally, uh, Hegel's another part of the criticism is, well, if the thing in itself is completely disconnected from us, how how do you know that it's there? You know what? How what would give you the idea that there is anything of that kind there? It's just your figment, the figment of your own imagination. Yeah, so, quoting Hegel, uh, in Kant, Ding an sich, the thing in itself, is an empty abstraction. But Hegel demands abstraction which corresponds to Der Sach. Oh, I guess he was quoting Lenin. Never mind. So der, der Sache. 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 Der Sache. Der Sache. 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 <laughs> Sache. Which, uh, what is that? I mean, I know the ding on sich is sich. Or, I don't know. Thing in itself, but what is der Sache? Der Sache? Uh, uh, no clue. Uh, matter, I guess. Uh, no, I don't think that's must be that could be right. Yeah, it it translates as matter, matter. Yeah, yeah. I guess matter not thing, as material, but like yeah, yeah. things, the material. object, cause maybe. In this dual theme, the category, the categorical rejection of the thing in itself and its counterpart, the existence of the essence and the phenomenon, which Lenin reads as the identity of the essence in the thing in itself, the essence identical with its phenomenon. Lenin is in agreement with Hegel, though the latter would not say that the reality of the thing in itself is the essence. A shade of meaning, perhaps, but an important one. Uh, indeed, an important one. Uh, because just uh, another, another just uh, autistic point. Uh, Essence in Hegel ends up being the totality of appearances. You know, what that thing essentially is, is all the things it can be, and will be, and has been. 
So it's not just any, it's not identical with any single one moment of appearance. But, uh, yeah. Why is it important? Because Hegel's criticism of Kant is a criticism of subjective idealism in the name of absolute idealism, which means that Hegel does not stop at a theory of the essence, but criticizes Kant in the name of a theory of the idea, whereas Lenin stops at what Hegel would call a theory of the essence. Here we see in the name of what Lenin criticizes Kant's subjectivism, in the name of objectivism, I have said. This term is too easily a pedant, a pendant of the term subjectivism for it not to be immediately suspect. Let us say rather that Lenin criticizes Kant's subjectivism in the name of, mater of a materialist thesis, which is a thesis conjointly of material existence and of scientific objectivity. In other words, Lenin criticizes Kant from the viewpoint of a philosophical materialism and scientific objectivity, thought together in the thesis of materialism. This is precisely the position of materialism and imperial criticism. And it is, uh, gotta say it, uh, a weak position, which is pre-Kantian. It criticizes Kant on the wrong points. Because uh, basically, like, uh, the beef Lenin has with Kant is uh, Kant and the people inspired by Kant, which were, I assume, the imperial criticists uh, had to be the Kantian. The second like, international. Um, that's, uh, I, I mean, it's, um, it's brought up later in the essay. But uh, Lenin was uh, trying to uh, differentiate himself between the, uh, the second international, which were... Um, which was heavily influenced by Kant. Yeah, so I can see the the hate boner for Kant. But the uh, the second one is that the Kantian split between noumena and phenomena, the thing in itself, and uh, what we can actually know and experience. Uh, it defeats his uh, love for science because it uh, it makes the ideal of science impossible, which is science wants to just say, look, we know the world, we know the real world, right? And uh, Kant says, yeah, no. You have objectivity, but you don't know the world. Um, so continuing. But enables us enables us to reveal a number of important consequences nonetheless. Let us run through them. The critique of Kant's transcendental subjectivism contained the selective reading in which Lenin lays bare Hegel and Tales. One. The elimination of the thing in itself and its reconversion into the dialectical action of the identity of essence and phenomena. Two, the elimination of the category of the subject, whatever transcendent, whether transcendental or otherwise. Three, with this double elimination of the reconversion of the thing in itself into the dialectical action of the essence and its phenomenon, Lenin produces an, an effect often underlined in materialism and imperial criticism, the liberation of scientific practice, finally freed from every dogma that would make it an ossified thing, thus restoring it into its rightful living existence, this life of science merely reflecting the life of reality itself. So yeah, it's... Uh, I mean, L Lenin is being uh, intelligent here in the grasping that the, this is the... the Kant, and uh, plenty of people grasp this, by the way, German idealists uh, also grasp this, which is why they went to trying to overcome Kant so strongly, which is Kant makes science impossible. And we we like science. And, uh, you know, uh, the thing is, uh, whereas the, the philosophers of German idealism noticed that this made not just the empirical science just impossible. And by the way, like the irony is Kant thought he was saving empirical science. The one thing that Lenin loves so much exactly from becoming this completely impossible thing that was just a subjective fiction. Because he thought that Hume's arguments uh, for skepticism were just utterly, uh, if taken seriously, destroyed the very possibility of science. And so Kant thinks he's actually saved science. And then everybody says, like, wait, no, you fucking, you doomed it even more. And then, you know, German idealists think they each have saved it somehow. And here Lenin comes again saying, he's like, no, you know, we got to save science again against Kant. You know, these Kantians just ruining everything. 
ruining our communism, ruining our material future. But yeah, so I can see totally a why one, the elimination of the thing in itself, and its reconversion of the dialectical action of identity of essence phenomenon. Obvious why he loves that relationship, because it's it's literally the relationship of science. Causality. You know, the inner and the outer, the essence. Essence and phenomena. Which is, if you got the phenomena, you can penetrate straight to the essence. Why? Because there is an imminent link. There's an, an essential. <laughs> God damn it. There is an inherent link, a necessary link between phenomena and essence. So, if you can interact with phenomena, you can definitely interact with essence. So, science is saved that way. The question is then, well, what does it that uh, that is? I suppose the stand-in for the theory of knowledge he had before. You know, another way to save it. Uh, the elimination of the category of the subject. Uh, you know, obviously it, he hates subjectivism. Uh, here I think it's a bit of determinism coming in, you know, uh, uh, Lenin definitely definitely had this the idea still very strong in Engels, not so strong in, stronger in early Marx, not so strong in, uh, in later Marx, about, you know, the inevitable march of history according to, you know, these dialectical principles of uh, the means of production and relations of production, forces of production. So, you know, if this is to be possible, if this is to be knowable and real, scientifically, well, you got to save scientific, the, the normal idea of scientific objectivity, which is the essential relation. Uh, but obviously, he, he must have uh, uh, misunderstood the sections on the subject in the, uh, the third part of the the subjective logic, which is to show that uh, the subject is the unifying point around which all these things happen. You know, when Hegel says substance is subject, all he means is the principle that drives, the principle of action, of doing in things, is their subjectivity. You know, objects are done to, subjects do to. And so, even by that normal, normy conception, which is god-awful, uh, it works. So you don't have to throw at the subject, but uh, you know, I understand why you did uh, the connotations of the time. So yeah, then the third point: the liberation of scientific practice. He's got the essential relation. Bam! Science is saved. You know the the skeptical. Uh, the skeptical attack is fended off and very solidly defeated. At least that's what. Lenin thinks. Uh, that's not what Hegel thinks at all. Hegel thinks that, that that account is incomplete and still is prone to skeptical attack. Just not, uh, perhaps, the Kantian skeptical attack. So, continuing, this is the categorical limit dividing Lenin from Hegel in their, criti their criticism of Kant. For Lenin, Hegel criticizes Kant from the viewpoint of the absolute idea, that is, provisionally, of God. Whereas Lenin uses Hegel's criticism of Kant to criticize Kant from the viewpoint of science, of scientific objectivity and its correlate, the material existence of its object. This is the practice of laying bare and peeling, or of refining as we can see it at a point where it is possible. Lenin takes what interests him from his point of view, from the discourse which Hegel is pursuing from a quite different point of view. What determines the principle of the choice is the difference in viewpoints, the primacy of science and its material object for Lenin, whereas as we know for Hegel, science, meaning the science of the scientists, which remains in the intellect, has no primacy, since in Hegel science is subject to, pri to the primacy of religion and philosophy, which is the truth of religion. So, right, typical misunderstandings of Hegel. I've mentioned it before. Um, I mean, Hegel says the absolute idea, the, the logic is God unfolding, you know, before uh, the creation of things. Uh, he just does it as a metaphor. Uh, the, the absolute idea is not God. Uh, God is literally spirit, and spirit is a, literally society. It doesn't exist before or outside of time or outside of matter. 
it literally exists as nature like nature isn't something afterward it, it's a uh, what is it called a di that's not di is it diachronic you know when it says diachronic. the same moment I, um, no. It might be synchronic, I think. Yeah, synchronic. It's a, at yeah, one, the same moment. Isn't... Yeah, it's a different moment. So the absolute idea, nature, and everything is just synchronic, basically. Well, why? Because it's a whole system. Uh, things have a principle of their own development, which is, uh, like it or not, immaterial, despite what Lenin wants to believe, and cannot be just understood within the relationship of phenomena and essence. There has to be more to be said about it to explain how this is really intelligible. Yeah, because the whole thing about essence and phenomena is they just rely on each other. <laughs> phenomena is the essence of essence, and essence is the phenomena of phenomena. <laughs> I love that. I love, I just gotta say, I love that I figured that out. The reflexivity of, of the logic, it's it's so fun. So, um, yeah, that uh, we'll leave it here at the. Or I don't know. Should we go on? Like it seems we just go. <laughs> we're so yeah, close to finishing. We don't. We don't really have that much left to read. Yeah. I'm yeah. Done. So yeah. So so far, uh, I get what Lennon's project is. Uh, I think it's actually pretty ingenious to to catch the things he did. Uh, for his own use in uh, in the logic, um, I get what Altusser's point is here. You know, uh, and by science, he's not meaning anything like really special. I think he, he's de definitely talking about material science, in the, in the usual way that people mean. And so, to attempt to save science from the the horror of Kant's uh, subject subjectivism, you know, he thinks he's got it. Uh, I don't think he's got it. But uh, he's definitely got it better than most, uh, definitely. <laughs> so, uh, section B, the chapter on the absolute idea. We move from paradox to paradox. I have just said that what interests Lenin and Hegel is the criticism of Kant, but from the point of view of scientific objectivity and not from the point of view of its truth, which, to be brief, is represented in Hegel by the absolute idea. And yet Lenin is passionately interested in the chapter on the absolute idea, which he sees as almost materialist. Quoting Lenin, It is noteworthy that the whole chapter on the absolute idea scarcely says a word about God, hardly ever has a divine notion slipped out accidentally. And apart from that, this, not the bene, it contains almost nothing that is specifically idealism, but has for its main subject the dialectical method. The sum total, the last word in essence on, of Hegel's logic, is the dialectical method. This is extremely noteworthy. And one thing more, in this most idealistic of Hegel's works, there is the least idealism and the most materialism. Contradictory, but a fact. How are we to explain this paradox? Well, let me explain it to you right now. <laughs> <laughs> the paradox is that yes the absolute idea is the method and the method has been exactly what has been driving the whole thing all along uh, the only reason that Lenin and uh, Althusser have to really think that the logic is idealistic as opposed to materialistic is that well guess what it deals with ideas and that's kind of the point it's the logic it's about thinking so it's not going to be dealing with anything else. And uh, insofar as it deals with <laughs> the irony, the matter which it deals with, which is the matter of thinking, uh, it deals with it exactly according to the method. So it is the materialist theory of knowledge, <laughs> literally. And uh, as I said, uh, you can go and read uh, uh, Andy Blunden's uh, essays on that uh, which show it uh, there there's nothing really here that anyone could ultimately disagree with if they really understood it uh, and saw how this actually related to everything we think 
So how are we to explain this paradox? Ultimately in a fairly simple way, but before doing so, I must go back a little. Last year in a paper I read at Jean Hippolyte's seminar, I showed what Marx owed to Hegel in theory. After critically examining the dialectic of what may, call, may be called the conceptual experiment carried out by Marx in 1840, the 1844 manuscripts, where Feuerbach's theory of the alienation of the human essence underwent a Hegelian injection, precisely the injection of the process of historical alienation, I was able to show that this combination was untenable and explosive, and in fact, it was abandoned by Marx on the one hand, the manuscripts were not published and their theses were progressively abandoned later, while on the other, hand, on the other it produced an explosion. The untenable thesis upheld by, 18, by Marx in the 1844 manuscripts was that history is the history of the process of alienation of a subject, the generic essence of man alienated in alienated labor. But it was precisely this thesis that exploded. The result of this explosion was the evaporation of the notions of subject, human essence, and alienation, which disappear completely atomized in the liberation of the concept of a process. I don't know if that, that is like process mm. in French, procès, procès. Yeah. In processes, in yeah. Latin. Yeah. Without a subject, which is the basis of all the analysis in capital. And here is where Althusser is uh, just, in his own time, wrong. Because by the time this is out, the Grundrisse has been out which disproves his whole thesis that Marx ever abandoned this stuff. And it's also the case that uh, knowing what a subject is in Hegelian sense, uh, capital totally has a subject. It's capital. Capital is the subject of capital. Capital drives capital. Marx himself provides evidence of this in a note to the French edition of Capital. This is interesting, for Marx must have added this note three or four years later after the appearance of the German edition. That is, after an interval which had allowed him to grasp the importance of this category and to express it to himself. This is what Marx wrote. The word procès, process, was, uh, which expresses a development considered in the totality of its real conditions, has long been part of the scientific language throughout Europe. In France, it was first introduced slightly, shamefacedly, in its Latin form, processus. Then, stripped of this pedantic disguise, it slipped into books on chemistry, physics, physiology, etc., and into a few works of metaphysics. In the end, it will obtain a certificate of complete naturalization. Let us note in passing that in ordinary speech, in the, Germ speech the Germans, like the French, use the word process, Process. 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 It's process. like the Z is the T S, t -S sound. Process. Process. Okay. Yeah. In the legal sense. Yeah, we use it here too. Yeah. Yeah. yeah the famous work by Kafka, The Trial, the German name is Der Prozess. So that's interesting. I didn't know that part of it, etymology. Nowadays, you know, we just yeah. think of process not as a totality, but just simply as an ongoing thing. It's like processed cheese. Otherwise known as American <laughs> cheese. Yeah. Or yellow cheese. Colloquially. Now, continuing. Now, for anyone who knows how to read Hegel's logic as a materialist, a process without a subject is precisely what can be found in the chapter on the absolute idea, uh, as also in the entire logic, hello, according to your own <laughs> definition. Jean Hippolyte decisively proved that Hegel's conception of history had absolutely nothing to do with any anthropology. The proof, history is the spirit, it is the last moment of the alienation of a process which begins with logic, continues with nature, and ends with the spirit. The spirit that is what can be presented in the form of history. For Hegel, quite to the contrary of the erroneous view of, the Co of Kojev and the young Lukács and of others since then, who are almost ashamed of the dialectics of nature, the dialectic is by no means peculiar to history, which means that history does not contain anywhere in itself, in any subject, its own origin. The Marxist tradition is quite correct 
was quite correct to return to the thesis of the dialectics of nature, which has the polit polemical meaning that history is a process without a subject, that, that, that the dialectic at work in history is not the work of any subject whatsoever, whether absolute or merely human, but that the origin of history is always already a thrust back before history, and therefore that there is neither a philosophical origin nor a philosophical subject to history. Now, what matters to us here is that nature itself is not in Hegel's eyes its own origin. It is itself the process of a reprocess of alienation which does not begin with it, that is, of a process whose origin is elsewhere in logic. So just to make a couple points here, and I, I will admit here before people claim, people claim that I claim to read stuff and that I haven't actually read it. Here I'm qualifying what I'm saying by telling you that I, <laughs> I haven't read the philosophy of... Uh, spirit which is uh, particularly the subjective spirit which is Hegel's anthropology uh, uh, by the way the phenomenology of spirit itself is a form of anthro one of the por portions of the anthropology uh, which shows you how much uh, Hegel put into it uh, the anthropology the philosophical anthropology is literally about what it is to be a biological being that is a thinking being of our kind so, of course, the philosophy of history is not going to be based uh, on the anthropo on anthropology. It's going to rely on elements about it to explain certain things within itself. But the reason the history can't be based on the anthropology is precisely because the realm of history is not really anthropological as a biological thing. Uh, it is its own... Uh, it has its own principle of development, which for Hegel, he assumes... Uh, he has his reasons for believing that history is the development of the relations of freedom uh, in the totality of a society as a state, you know, spirit as a state, its concrete form. And that is simply, you know, the ways things work. Uh, likewise in capital, the developments of capital have nothing to do with human biology. Uh, the way capital works has nothing to do with uh, psychological urges which are just natural to the endemic to the human being or whatever it's not like capitalism is in our genes but rather capitalism is a social relation that appears as a relation of right you know it appears within the spheres that's kind of sphere of right in civil society and it has its own principle of development you know which is detached from other things and uh, that's all it means so when he, when Mar the Althusser is talking about it. What he means by, you know, no subject being there is exactly what Hegel means by a subject being there, uh, strangely enough. So, you know, it's not that Althusser here is any, has any disagreement with Hegel or that Lenin had any disagreement with Hegel. Actually, they're quite in agreement. They just disagree on the words. The content is virtually the same. So, you know, by what uh, Alto Sirius says about a process, uh, we can then say, yeah, actually, then Hegel is the philosopher of process, the philosopher of things considered the totality of development, which I think Lukács is very much uh, right on. So I, I don't know how Alto Sirius was having disagreements with Lukács over this. Yeah, seems kind of weird to me. He's critical of Lukács elsewhere too, not just in this essay. Like if you um if you read Reading Capital, he has chapters where he goes over Gramsci and Lukács, and he uh he strongly disagrees with them both. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So let's continue. This is where the question becomes really fascinating. For it is clear that Lenin swept aside in one sentence the absurd idea that nature was a product of the alienation of logic, and yet he says the chapter on the absolute idea is quasi-materialist. Surprising. And just another uh, caveat. Uh, the whole term of alienation is just like, it, it's a technical term. It's just like, you know, the outsidedness of things. If something is outside of you, it's alien to you. Well, guess what? Nature, nature is the outside of logic to itself, so it's logic outside of itself. Woo, alienation. Spooky. What, in fact, is the status of logic in Hegel? It is double. 
On the one hand, logic is the origin itself, that which it is impossible to go back beyond, and that with which the ulterior process of alienation begins. Hence, this process of alienation does seem to have a subject, logic. But when we examine closely the nature of this subject, which is supposed to be absolute, precisely in the chapter on the absolute idea, we find that it is the origin negated as an origin. This can be seen as two points in particular. So, right on. Hegel agrees. <laughs> uh, he says it himself uh, the circle of circles has no actual origin uh, there is no beginning there really is no starting point theoretically you could start anywhere absolutely anywhere with anything and derive the entire system so you know it's not that logic is the first the logic is the first only for us because it's going to provide the assurance of the foundation that we know what we're fucking talking about because we're going to investigate what knowledge actually is. Uh, but other than that, like, uh, once the whole thing is set up, you're like, and you know, you're like, oh, well, yeah, there were things prior, you know. Obviously, logic depends on an actual existing thinking, thinking subject, and that depends on an actual existing culture. That ex depends on an actual existing body and nature, the whole shebang. So, yeah, no, no disagreement there. So, Continuing, firstly at the beginning of the logic, which negates what it begins with from the very beginning by immediately negating being and nothingness, which can only mean, which can only mean one thing, the origin must simultaneously be affirmed and negated. Hence, the subject must be negated from the moment that it is positive. That it is posited. Um, so uh, I get what he's saying, which is strange. Like uh, to phrase in Hegelian terms, what he's calling subject here is a sort of substance. Uh, whereas for Hegel, subject is just exactly that, that movement of negation, that is the subject, the process, the process of the doing of the thing to itself. Secondly, in Hegel's famous thesis that the absolute idea is simply the absolute method, the method which, as it is nothing but the very movement of the process, is merely the idea of the process as the only absolute. Lenin applies his materialist reading, his materialist reading to this double thesis of Hegel's, and that is why he so he is so fascinated by the absolute idea. He thus lays bare and refines this notion too, retaining the absolute but rejecting the idea, which amounts to saying that Lenin takes from Hegel the following proposition: There is only one thing in the world which is absolute, and that is the method or the concept of the process itself absolute. And as Hegel himself suggested by the beginning of the logic, being equals nothingness, and by that very place of logic, origin negated as origin, subject negated as subject, Lenin finds in it a confirmation of the fact that it is absolutely essential, and as he had learned simply from a thoroughgoing reading of capital, to suppress every origin and every subject, and to say what is absolute is the process without a subject, both in reality and in scientific knowledge. Absolutely agree. As I was, you know, as I said, uh, what is the subject of everything? You know, the absolute idea is the process, the the way of doing, the negating. How does it happen through the method? Uh, but here, Althusser is being incomplete, and Lenin are being incomplete in that they don't realize that if you follow the process through, you're gonna get a circle. Uh, logically speaking, if you follow this process through on a quote-unquote materialist basis, which is empirically based. Of course, you will never get a final closing of the circle because materially, you know, the world is extended to infinity as far as we know. Uh, you know, there's always some other atom that causes this atom. There's always some other force that causes this force. Uh, you know, some other process that in initiated this process, some other part of the process, and it just never ends. And all you know is like, well, there was a doing, there's a happening, which is actually a very Eastern kind of thing. You know, there's just a happening. There really aren't things in the end. No subjects, so to say. Uh, not to denigrate Eastern All right, thinking, Jim by the Jerry. way. <laughs> not to denigrate Eastern uh, thinking, by the way. I mean, it's a pretty, yeah. pretty good conception. Um, another point to bring in here is that... Uh, the reason they seem to not uh, grasp the the process creates its own system is uh, 
they're not holding to a, a robust notion of determinate negation in a logical sense. Uh, they probably hold it just like Mao, where it's a, a material relation, an empirical one, but not really one at the level of concepts of uh, the essences of things, as Lenin says, which is uh, curious. So, continuing, as this proposition breaks through, that is, constantly touches the surface, or rather the skin, all that is needed to lay it bare to obtain the Marxist-Leninist concept of the materialist dialectic, of the absoluteness of movement, of the absolute process, of the reality of the method, to be precise, the concept of the fundamental scientific validity of the concept of a process without a subject, as it is to be found in Capital, and elsewhere too, in Freud, for example. The materialist thesis is of the materialist existence and of the objectively objectivity of scientific knowledge thus finds a confirmation which is both radical and disconcerting here in the chapter on the absolute idea completely disconcerting for a reader of Hegel who has not read Marx <laughs> I read both and I'm not disconcerted also sir <laughs> but completely natural for a reader of Hegel who has read Marx uh, I think readers of Hegel would also not be disconsidered who haven't read him. I would even say na completely natural for anyone who, without having read Hegel, could speak of him in com complete ignorance, that is, in complete knowledge of the situation in the strongest sense. Like the 24-year-old who, in 1894, wrote the 12 pages on Hegel that I have discussed. Uh, well, uh, I don't quite buy that. <laughs> But I would One. say that, well, I'm what he's saying, that like, you know, that Lenin understood Hegel before he, he read Hegel, oh, which yeah. is totally bullshit. But I would say uh, he missed an opportunity here to say one can be perfectly dialectical in both the, the sense that uh, he means it and the sense that Hegel means it, in the sense of the process without a subject, without ever having read either Marx or Hegel. And I think there are plenty of the people in this world who have conceptions of that kind without knowing about them. Because they think, and they see the they see things in this manner. I mean, if you can if you can conceive that the truth of, for example, a caterpillar is the entire species of the butterfly, you've conceived something as this process without a subject. It just happens. You know, it's the DNA in the caterpillar lives and eats, turns to a chrysalis, becomes a butterfly. <laughs> it doesn't. It doesn't intend anything. The butterfly goes, mates, has sex, has eggs, and the eggs grows, and you know, there you go. You get a caterpillar, and there you go. Dialectics, bam. Nobody, nobody ever had to mention anything about subjectivity, negativity, negations, contradictions. It just happens because it's just good thinking, good proper thinking. So, continuing, with these comments as starting point, I ask you in your turn to try to reread Lenin reading Hegel, and to tell me if the shocking proposition I put forward a moment ago is not the very truth. A century and a half later, no one has understood Hegel because it is impossible to understand Hegel without having thoroughly studied and understood capital. Yeah, well, I, I will deny that. Sorry, all this here. It's a yeah. catchy phrase, though. It's catchy. It's, 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 uh, catchy. Yeah. Wrong. It's, uh, Catchy, you know, it catches your attention. You're like, what? That sounds like bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> he knows it too. What That's why he said. Kaya, have you read Capital? Yeah, yeah, I've read. Oh shit, you get large Lenin? chunks of it. <laughs> what? You understand Wait, Lenin? Do I understand Lenin? I, I mean, uh, Hegel. Sorry, you understand Hegel, Hegel now? Yeah. Uh, I haven't read Hegel in yeah, depth. But you've read Capital. You uh, understand Hegel. I guess so. <laughs> well, I mean, reading, like, listening to the stuff we say, like, does it sound that far off? You know, because that's kind of Altusser's point. I mean, I'm not putting you on your spot, just kind of joking yeah, around. It's... Obviously, like, yeah. yeah, it's too much, too much uh, thinking even for me right now to be talking about this. <laughs> talking about the, the commodity and the, all those other things. But anyways. Thanks to Lenin, we can begin not to read or interpret, but to understand the Hegelian philosophical world while, trans while transforming it, of course. Allow me to recall this divination of Hegel by Lenin, and then his reading of Hegel. We're only pa I'm sorry. 
Allow me to recall that this divination of Hegel by Lenin, and then his reading of Hegel, were only possible from a proletarian class viewpoint, and with the new practice of philosophy that follows from it. Um, I'll call bullshit on that too, because that has nothing to do with proletarians. Like Lenin's whole beef with that was fundamentally Lenin wanted to believe. Lenin was just like Engels. He's like, we love science, guys. We really love material science. Like, just like how you know Engels, like, uh, was in love with Darwin, and like same thing with Marx. You know, to the extent that they, they thought he was right. Uh, they were in love with what physics was doing. That you know, science gives you power over the world. It gets you to do things. It's practical. It's real. You know, they really hated anybody who brought up any argument that could block the claim that we really know the world. And it has nothing to do with a proletarian standpoint. It has to do with the standpoint of we want to do science. You know, Marx and Engels didn't claim that they were doing science just because they thought they oh, were doing some business stuff. You know, just being systematic. Uh, no, uh, this goes for Marx as well as Engels and Lenin. They thought they were doing science, material science, that they were really getting at the core of the mechanism of the thing, how it really works, and that if you tweak this, it's going to do that. And, you know, the Kantian and the imperial criticists, like, blocks on that were something that, you know, they they would have wished were just had not existed and they sh would have loved to never have dealt with it. But they had to deal with it because they were dealing with philosophical matters themselves. So it has nothing to do with a proletarian standpoint, really. So perhaps we can learn a lesson from this for the present and the future. For all in all, the situation in 1969 is less serious for the international Marxist workers' movement than it was in 1915, which does not mean that the task is not immense. It is only less difficult, despite appearances. On one condition, which Marx demanded of his reader, on the threshold of capital, that he has the courage to think for himself and about what is in preparation, even at moderate or long distance, what is in preparation among the masses, for it is they and not the philosophers who make history. All right. Uh, good piece, uh uh, that was a, be, yeah, good. Um, no, I was just going to say that was a very good discussion. Very worth oh. it. Yeah. yeah. I learned a lot. It was worth AW uh, going on rants about stuff. It was fun. So, yeah, so um, do you think, agree with his final, the his final, like, conclusion that it's not for philosophers to make history, but for the masses. Yeah, obviously that's wrong. Yeah. Not because philosophers make history <laughs> or the masses make history, but because it's obvious that you got to think about this as exactly he was talking about, a process. And the process of history includes a process in which ideas come about, ideas are spread, conditions for ideas come, ideas yeah. become powerful, they become believed, they become a motive force in history, according to Marx. Yeah, he's just giving precedence to the movement itself, to the to the not the movement to the yeah. Like, so I mean, uh, so obviously, I mean, I know what he's saying this because even at then, it's still the idea that you know the masses don't do anything. It's the great men of history, you know, it's the men yeah. of ideas who move things. And Hegel himself says the same thing. He's like, mm -hmm. you know, mark this well, you mark this men of action. You are nothing but the unconscious instruments of the men of thought, right? Yeah, you know, which is basically him giving priority to the ideas and in the way he says in the way he means it I ultimately have to side with Hegel because without yeah. ideas you ain't gonna get no movement towards anything without some idea some I, without some I mean, idea it requires the men of action too it's well, no, just but like, I'm saying no no both. yeah no that's yeah. what I'm saying I'm saying that when you understand what Hegel means by it Hegel's not reducing the world to just the ideas he's saying mm -hmm. the ideas really do ultimately have precedence in that without the uh, ideas, well, nothing would have ever moved. Oh, sure. Yeah. They have precedence, like, as an order. They're, they're first. But, yeah. you know, without the men of action, I think that was his point. Like, the men of action discounting the men of thought, not saying we're better than you. Yeah. Yeah. And men of action so, say, so, oh, well, we're just doing things. Well, you're not going to do anything unless you know what you're doing. 
So you have to think about it or have someone tell you what to do. Yeah, pretty much. And if, I mean, I, I don't see how any Marxist could deny that. Uh, if it were not for the theory of capital, if it wasn't for the ideas of Marx himself, uh, would 1917 have, have, have occurred in the way it did? I don't think so at all. Probably not. I think there would have been, you know, definitely a lot of discontent, but not this grasp, of, you know, that just this utter belief in a scientific socialism of sort that, you know, that made people think that it was possible to really do that. As opposed to, you know, utopian ideas. So, yeah, ultimately uh, a really good essay. Uh, I don't disagree with much uh, here in the end. Uh, you know, besides like uh, their digs at Hegel, in which, uh, uh, you know, are both fair and unfair, I think. Uh, fair in that they uh, People we around the day. Yeah, I know why they say them, and also it's just like, uh, unless you were a Hegel scholar yourself at the time, and even then, like uh, much of the scholarship was awful. Uh, so you know, much of the most popular Hegelians were, yeah, the uh, quote unquote idealist ones who believed in God and all these other things. The theological interpretation. So I can see why, and you know why they wanted to just, just really distance themselves from that, uh, and with the rising of the Hegelian Marxists. Uh, there was a fear of like, oh my God, we're going to slip back into like um, idealism, and I I think also Sarah is right to be afraid of that because guess what? That's exactly what happened. Not because I mean, of the Hegelian Marxists, but because yeah. people retreat into pure theory, and no activity has been really happening ever since. I mean, Althusser's writings are very much polemics against the uh, cafe intellectuals of his day. If you uh, I, and I saw that you caught that, so yeah. So yeah, uh, other than that, that's good. Uh, uh, I want to read uh, the uh, state apparatus, uh, repressive state apparatus. Uh, that should be interesting. Uh, it's considered one of his, it's his most popular work or piece of his works. So uh, we'll do that some other time, but yeah. Uh, hope you all learned something, uh, both about uh, Lenin, Althusser, Hegel, and Marx. So, see you next time. Goodbye. Good.